I want to welcome everybody here. So great to have you all with us. Um, as always, it's great for I love looking through the faces, looking through the black boxes with names. For those who don't want to put up your uh, put on your videos, it's just always nice to see faces and names and people and part of this wonderful, wonderful community of learners. Um, our program tonight is our usual program. We're going to learn the last off together. Um, it's uh, about an amud and a little bit. Uh, we're going to have then two other speakers, and I will get started. So our Mishnah, we're going to start from the Mishnah on Lama Tedim a bit. Just if you can look in the chat, there's a study guide. You can also go on our site. Um, you can get the Safaria there if you want. On the today's page has the summary from today. It has the, the study guide. I did some English. What I did was uh, the titles are in English, which should help you. The charts read Hebrew to English. So you have to read them the opposite way. Um, but the but the main the main titles of the, the different sections are in English. Okay, starting with our Mishnah. Very exciting to be finishing the Masechet with all of you. Um, we did this yesterday, which is, if your fruits were in another city, we've been talking for the last while about, is, about Tchum, Tchum Shabbat. That means wherever I am, I can only go within 2,000 cubits around my city. And in addition, my anything that belongs to me goes with me. So now we're discussing situations where I have something that belongs to me, but it was outside of my tchum before Yantif started. So now my perotav were be'irachetet. Now what's the issue? Again, we keep going back and I'll, I'll kind of end with this. We'll talk about it at the very end. This idea that I need food. I need food on Yantif. So we're sitting now on Yantif and I need my food and there's somewhere else. Am I allowed to do this? So what's the issue? If Ervu B'nei Tahir, the people in that city knew that my fruits were in their city and they said, I'm going to make an Erev so that we can bring the fruits to you. Lo they can't because what's the issue? My fruits are not in my tchum, so I'm not allowed to access them at all. But who? But if I made my own eruv, then perotav kamo. Then even though I'm not in that city, but I made an eruv which allowed me to get into that city, and my fruits were within my eruv, tchumin, I can bring my fruits to me. Misha zimen at slow orchim, someone who invited friends. All I can think about when I, I'll, I'll read it and then I'll tell you what comes to my mind. You invite guests. Lo yolichem biadam note. You can't send them home with leftovers, right? I remember reading one of these cookbooks and they they tell you, you know, if you really want, have extra Tupperware containers in your house so that when you when you have guests and you want to get rid of all the leftovers, just send people with the food, right? You'll have containers already prepared and send your guests off with them. So here we have an issue. Now, of course, you can send your guests. What's the issue here? Of course, you could send home food. The issue is that if your guests came from outside the tchum and you didn't make an Eruv, they made an Eruv tchum and they could come to your house, but they can't take your food with them because that food was not within their Eruv. However, there's a solution to this. And that, right, again, it's funny because you think this is such an issue they want to find a solution for, right? You think people in those days had so much food like we do nowadays that we always want to send people home with leftovers. Nobody wants to have so many leftovers in their house. Again, there are people who do like that, but many people want to get rid of them because I know my kids hate leftovers. Um, so anyway, here's your solution. I can come from Erev Yom Tov and I can say to my neighbor, I want you to accept ownership rights for these people. And then you can, at that point, he accepts the air of those people on him and where they can go and the fruits become as if they're in the other person's possession. And this is something we're going to discuss a lot today, which is an object that theoretically is in one person's possession, but we can legally turn it into someone else's possession for the purposes of air so that you can carry things into the other person's air and not your own, not necessarily only yours. So here starts the Gemara, Itma. Itmar is always an introduction to a machloket emoraim. Hamafkid perot etzel chavero. So somebody gives somebody fruits to watch. This sounds like a sugi and baba metzia, where we taught we're going to learn about baba when we get there, all about shomrim, somebody watching my item. So I give you my fruits to watch. The question is, it's in your house. You have a different Eruv Tchumen than I do, let's say. You made an Eruv going, you know, in a different direction than I did, or you live in a different city. You have my fruits for Yantif. So Ravamal, so the, obviously the question is, they're my fruits, but they're in your possession. You're watching them for me. So does that make them your tchum or is it my tchum? So Rav says, 
It's the person who they were watching for, meaning, okay, it's a very complicated language. What it really means simply is, fine, I give you my fruits to watch. It goes by me because they're my fruits. Shmuel amal kiraglei ham, sorry, yeah, kiraglei, sorry, I think I said that wrong. Kiraglei mishiv kidu lo, meaning, I just messed that up. It's the opposite. Mishiv kidu lo is the one who they gave it to, okay? The one who's watching it. Shmuel says, the mafkid is me. I gave you my fruits to watch. So Shmuel says it goes by me. And Rav says it goes by the person who's actually watching your fruits. Now they say, wait a minute. We should suggest here that what? Rav and Shmuel go according to their normal shitot. What does that mean? Rebbe Yomer, le'olam e'no chayav, ad shekabel ha'bala bayat l'shmo. Okay, before I get into this, let's give some background. We're talking about a Mishnah here. Comes up in Dine Nezikin, in Baba Kama, actually. And it says that if I bring in, let's say I bring in my dog into your house, okay? This actually just happened on Shabbat. I went into someone's house, we were taking a walk, and there were two big dogs there, and I walked in with a friend who had a small dog, and the small dog immediately started to get attacked by another dog, not the dog, okay, the owner is here listening, not the dog who actually owned the house, but the dog who was at that house, okay? So they were in the person's house with permission, and then they went and damaged, okay, luckily no damage happened, everyone was okay, but theoretically, if that dog had damaged the other dog, who'd be responsible? Is it the dog, the owner of that dog, or since the person who owned the house let the dog in with permission, then maybe that person's responsible because it was really her house. She should have been the one who's responsible. So here, this is what the Mishnah says. If that dog owner's had the dog that came in, the owner asked for permission from the owner of the house. Is it okay if I bring my dog into your house? And the owner said, yes. Then, bala chatzir chayav. If any damage occurs, it's the person who owns the house. They assumed responsibility by, by saying you could come in. Rebbe Omer, what are you talking about? I said you could come bring your dog into my house. I didn't say I was watching your dog. I was babysitting your dog. No, I just said your dog could come into my house. But I didn't assume any responsibility. So this is, first of all, I want to just get it clear. We started with a machloket Rav and Shmuel, and now we're moving to a machloket between two Tanaim. We wanted to connect Rav and Shmuel to their own opinions. So we're going to see their own opinions right now. The Amar Rav Huna Amar Rav. Rav Huna said in the name of Rav, Halacha Kedibre Chachamim. We hold like the rabbis, that im yechniz bereshut, once you let it in. It's, right, Bala Chatzir Chayav, you accept the responsibility. That's why he says, Right, the, who's got the responsibility? The one whose house it's in. So therefore, that matches his opinion by us. Who gets it? By whose tomb do we go by? The one who the fruits are in his house. And Shmuel Amar Halacha Rebbe. He says no until he accepted upon himself the Shmuel. So likewise, Shmuel says Halacha Rebbe. And Lema, the Gemara is going to say Lema Rav de Amar Kirabanan. Now, what's the connection here? You have to think about this connection a little bit. What Shmuel's saying, it's kind of a little bit like an analogy. Shmuel's saying, if you accept, okay, if you hold like Rebbe, that means the person whose courtyard it is said, you can bring your animal in, but I didn't say I was going to watch it. Likewise, in our case, I said, I'll, you said you watch my fruits, but you didn't say, I was going to determine what the tomb was, that it's going with my tomb. You accepted what you did. You didn't accept what you did it. I said, sure, come into my house. You didn't say I'm responsible. Sure, bring your fruits into my house. But I didn't say they're going to go by my tomb. So it's only kind of, it's, it's almost like a, they say in Hebrew, Rosh Katan. Like, this is what I said. I didn't say any more than what I said. I wasn't going beyond that. So now they suggest this looks like the exact same machloket. But we're now going to say that each one could say, I actually agree with the opposite opinion, because these cases are not really comparable. We're used to this already. Hamar lecha Rav. Rav would say, right, he didn't say this, but Rav would say, we could put words in his mouth. Ana da'amre afilu I really hold even like Rebbe. 
But ad kan lo ka amarebi hatam ela de bistama lo kabil alene tiruta. In other words, I would hold with Rebbe in the case of the dog situation. Because yes, I said the dog could come into my house, but I never said I was going to be responsible for it. But hacha hakabil aleni tiluta. But here I said I would you said you would watch my fruits. That you're watching my fruits goes hand in hand with tum. In other words, if you're watching them, then you're in your possession, you're responsible. That means it goes by your tum. So those are two very different situations, he says. And therefore, right, hacha, right, hakabi, you said you were going to do nitiruta is shmira, is watching. Ushmuel amal, Shmuel said, anadam layafidu the rabbanan. I could actually agree with the rabbis. Why? Ad kan lo kamre rabbanan hatam, ela, this is a great line. Dinicha le li'inish jenekum tore bereshute to bala chatzila. When it came, again, this is all about, we always talk about this, and it's all about intention. When that, let's take the case I brought up on Shabbat. So my friend brought the dog to the house of the other person. It happened the owner of the dog was there. So let's just assume the owner wasn't there and left the dog in the house. Now, don't you assume that he was hoping that my friend would be responsible if the dog did anything, right? It's, it's in his interest that if he leaves something of his, he doesn't want to assume responsibility or she doesn't want to assume responsibility. So basically, this is what the words say. It's good for, it's, it's in the person's self-interest or their best interest. That he basically says, listen, when I asked you, can I bring my dog into your house? What I meant was, obviously, and you'll listen responsibility if anything were to happen. Otherwise, why would I, right? Let's, let's put it this way, right? What if, I'll, I'll use a different example. You bring a kid to someone's house and then your kid hurts the friend, you know, while they're there or, you know, like little kids and someone bites someone else, you know, you assume that the mother's taking responsibility when the kids are there or the father's taking responsibility, right? You don't assume, oh, I'm just leaving my kid and whatever happens, happens. So, you know, you figure someone there needs to be responsible. So it's in your interest. right? And he didn't want to accept responsibility for any damages the animal might do. But here, right, now, I give you my fruits to watch, but I want the manyantif, what's obviously in my best interest, that it goes by my tchum, not your tchum. So therefore, in the animal case, or me putting, by the way, it could be anything I put in your chatzir that theoretically could damage, could cause damages. So if I put it in your courtyard, that's not, I want it to be in your responsibility. In this case, I don't want it to be in your tchum. That would be a big pain in the neck for me. Then I won't be able to access it. So therefore, the cases are incomparable. Okay, that's what we're up to right now. Now the Gemara is going to say, Tanan, wait a minute. We have some questions against Rav's opinion. Again, Rav said, it goes by the person whose house it is and not the person whose fruits they are. So look at our Mishnah. Our Mishnah says, V'im erevhu, if my fruits were in some other town and I made an Eruv, perotav kamohu. Now, what were my fruits doing in some other town? I know someone asked this yesterday, you know, when we learned it the other day, I think someone asked, right, what, what are the fruits doing in someone's house? Right, what are they, what, why would they be there? So if you sit, right, it says, if you made an Eruv, then Perotav Kamo. Now, if we're assuming now, why were they in another town? Because I asked you to watch my stuff. So this is the same kind of case. And now, if we say it goes by whoever it's there, who's, who has house it's in, then what does it help me if I made an Eruv? That doesn't help at all. So Amr Rav Huna, Amr Be Rav, Kigon Shi Chelo Karen Savit. Now we're going to learn that there's two ways I could put my fruits in your house. You, I could give you my fruits and say, take care of them, watch them. But you can also say, listen, you want me to watch your fruits? Fine. I'm putting them in this room. I'm not going to touch them. They're going to be in this corner. That's your corner. And then it's sort of yours. Okay. And then it's sort of yours to the extent that you can then say, ah, well, it's sort of mine. Therefore, I can access them. If I did an A roof, then I'll be able to bring them into my territory. And then it goes by you because you put the, the person designated them in a particular corner and that allowed me to be able to still say they're mine. As opposed to, I bring it to their house and they decide what they want to do with it, then it's their responsibility. So it sort of depends how it all came about. And we're going to have the same answer to the next question, which is Tashma. Again, we're going to learn from the Mishnah. Misha zimen etzlo orchim. Remember we said you could give someone the day before and say, listen, I want you to accept ownership for those people who are going to get it. Now, if they're in my house 
And then, right, and I'm really giving them to you, but they're in my house. I'm like a shomer, right? Like the person watching. So, what does it help that I gave ownership rights? It's still in my house and we go by me. So, again, it's as if I gave them a corner of space. Okay, so that's our answer that we have anytime we seem to have an issue. Say, there's a little bit of a difference if you give them to watch it or they put it into a corner for you. Um, by the way, I wanted to just go back for a minute to Rav. There was something I neglected to mention, which is that there's a debate about Rav when he says it goes by the person who's watching it. So there's actually a debate about what he means. Does he mean 100% it's in the, it goes by the tomb of the person who's watching it? Or is it one of those cases we talked about the overlapping? It's that it can only be taken to the place that overlaps between me and the other person and is somewhat joint. Because some people say, they look at Rav and they say, how could you possibly say that if they're my fruits, that it doesn't go by me at all? So some people actually have a different approach to say that it's an overlap. And the other approach and the other logic, that's what's the logic of Rav? Because really they're my fruits. Why shouldn't they be with my tone? So one of the answers given is a really good answer, which is that if I give you my stuff to watch, let's say there's a fire in your house and you try to you know, take stuff out of your house. If you can't carry, I mean, maybe a fire is an extreme example, but let's say, you know, for whatever reason, I gave you my fruits to watch. That means you might have to move them for whatever reason you might have to move them. And if I don't give you rights to move them as far as you can move them, then you're not necessarily going to be a, a very good, you're not going to watch them very carefully because you might have to move them and you won't be able to. So it's as if, again, it's about my intent. My intent is to give you rights to be able to move these as you need, as you see fit. So therefore, that's a reason to say that he has 100% rights. That would explain his opinion. Now we're going to have a story. Okay. Oh, wait, there's one more answer. I forgot. One more answer to this question against the case about the guests. It could be that by me transferring ownership, that's already different. That's not the same as someone gave me, I'm watching something of someone else's, but I actually did an action to transfer ownership then it maybe it will work. So maybe that, that isn't even really such a question. Now we have an interesting story and it actually has a kind of funny ending. Um, a little bit of a, of a, I would say, the rabbis are almost a little bit laughing at themselves uh, at the end of this story. We're gonna start off thinking that this story connects to our issue and they're gonna get stuck with a whole slew of questions. And in the end, they're gonna say, it must be that this is talking about something entirely different and has nothing to do with tchum. Okay, but we think in the beginning it has to do with our mission. So the Gemara says, Rav Chana Bar Chanilai Tala Bisra Be'ivra Dedasha. Okay, Rashi fills in a few details for us. Tala Bisra Be'ivra Dedasha means he hung meat on the door, okay, on the, by the door. So now, Rashi says he was in a guest house, Beit Ush Bizchine, Shenatnulo Tabachea Irmi Ba'odion. He got meat from the butchers the day before. Vuaya Ben Ir Acheret, Shema'avi Lo Lavo Lakan. He was in a different city. He really lived in a different city, but he was staying there overnight and he was planning to go back in the morning to his city, which was within, he made a tchum, right? An air of tchum in so that he could go back home. The big question is this piece of meat that was hanging there that he got from the butchers, does it go by him or not? So they say here, right? That's what we're assuming the question is, right? Can he bring the meat home? So we assume, can he bring the meat home, right? Where our head is all into air of tchum and we assume this has to do with, is it considered within his tomb or not? So onto the Kamei de Rav Huna, he goes to Rav Huna and Rav Huna tells him, even though it says that he hung the meat himself, maybe he didn't give over the full details of the story. So he says to him, it depends. Amrle, i atalit, if you hung it up there, zil shko, if you're the one who hung the meat up, you can take it, because obviously, right, it was in your possession already. I inu talule, if he hung it up, lo tishko, you can't take it. Now we assume simply because he hung it up, not you, meaning the innkeeper. It goes by the innkeeper's tchum. Now, this is a bit problematic for various things that we've learned already. You might be thinking, right, that doesn't make sense. Though. He hung it up for you. It should go by you. We'll get to all that. And that's why in the end, they're going to reject this. But first, they ask a question on the first part, which is if you hung it yourself, you can take it. So, i iutale mi So, they say, wait a minute. Uh, sorry, um, wrong line. Baha Rav Huna. Tell me the Rav Hava. They say, wait a minute. Rav Huna was a student of Rav. Rav says it goes by whoever is watching it for you. Now you hung it on the door of whose house? The innkeeper. It should go by the innkeeper. 
So how could that be? We already know the answer because this is the answer that we keep saying. Uh, because Shana Ivra did Dasha, because he hung it on the door. It's as if he said, right, that corner of my house is yours. This door, you know, you hung it on the door handle. That's your space. No problem. So again, if he hung it himself, he gets to take it home without an issue. However, we're now going to have three questions on the second section, which is the second part of his answer. So the second part of his answer was, if the, the innkeeper hung it, or maybe the butcher hung it, you can't take it home. So Amarav, um, sorry, Amarle Rav Hila Lerav Ashi. So the first two, it's interesting, are two people who ask Rav Ashi a question. The third question is going to be Rav Ashi himself is going to ask a third question. So he says to Rav Ashi, Vi inu talele, lo shakil, really? Why can't you take it? Just because he hung it for you. Remember, we learned this. The person who fattens up the meat, remember, he intends to sell it to people. So even if before you had to be hadn't sold it, it could go by whoever buys it. That sounds like just like this case, really, he sold it to this person. The person was going to take it home. It was even done before you had to, if it shouldn't be a problem. Question number one. Question number two. Amalei Ravina Ravashi. V'inu talele lo shakil. Again, same question. What do you mean he can't take it? Remember, we have like Rabbi Dosa who said, if there's one shepherd in the city and you know that you're going to give it to that shepherd, it's going to go by the shepherd. So again, here, he gave it to that person already before Yantif. Obviously, he should be able to take it home. Third question, which is a bit of a strange question. Uh, Rabbi Nochanal actually has a different gear sense, says that wasn't the line in the mission he really was quoting as a question. It really is a different line, but we'll just explain it simply like this. Sorry, Amr le Rab Ashi le Rab Kahan. The inu talele lo shakil. Again, same question. He can't take it. But none. It says in the Mishnah, habe maba kilim kiraglea balim. Your animal and your utensils, everything goes by you. And again, if you go with the simple reading here and not that there's a different gear set, some people say it should be the case where someone borrows something. But in any case, at this point, it was his. He owned it. It should go by him. So you should be able to bring this home. To which the Gemara says, and here's the funny line, which is really the, I think the rabbis are a little bit mocking themselves. Elashani Ravchana Barchani Lai, Degaver Rabbi, who is a great rabbi, right? So you think they're going to say really good things about him. Vitari Bishmate, he was very distracted, okay, right? Absent minded, you could say. Okay, people who are sitting and they're learning all the time, they get very absent minded and he wasn't paying attention. Vahi Kamerle. This is what Rafun is psakis. This has absolutely nothing to do with Tum. The question is can you bring it home or not? Can you assume that the meat is kosher or not? Now, why is there a question of the meat being kosher? If you remember, or maybe we haven't learned it on this, uh, I think we learned it in Erevin actually about this concept of basar shenitaleimena ayin. Meat that you didn't, right? You don't know what happened to it. You took your eyes off it. It's like the nine stores. It's a little different, but it's this concept that meat that you were watching it and then you turned away and then you look again. Maybe a bird came and snatched the meat and put a different piece of meat in its place. And how do you know it's the same piece? So, says like this, here's the, what does the distracting thing have to do with it? He says the following, if you hung it up, he says two things. You know what the piece of meat looked like. If you hung it yourself, even though you're absent-minded, you probably kind of looked at it. And you knew it was there, so you knew that if you didn't pay attention to it, it was going to become, which means maybe someone snapped, you know, switched the meat, and maybe it's not the same piece. So you were paying attention. However, that was the first part of what Rav Huna said. But, and therefore, Zil Shkol, you can take it. The Inu Talulach, but if he hangs it for you, okay, this is classic, okay? If you don't do something yourself, you often don't really remember that it happened, right? If, if you do something yourself, you'll remember that. Someone tells you, listen, I left a piece of meat for you. Right? how many times this happened? I actually, I'm just remembering now, this happened today. Somebody left me a key, okay? They said, I said, leave it in my mailbox. I'll go get it. I totally forgot because I didn't do it. I had nothing to do with it. Said it was leaving me a key. I, it happens to be sitting in my mailbox right now because I'm distracted, right? So that's exactly what happened here. If he hung it for you, you're not going to pay attention and watch that piece of me because you don't, it didn't really enter your head to notice that it was there for you. So therefore, you didn't pay attention and therefore it might not be kosher meat at this point because somebody might have swapped the piece and you have no way of knowing that it was the same piece. There's really two issues. One is you didn't really look at it and pay attention to the details of it. And number two, you weren't paying attention all the time and keeping your eye on it. So it means it means you weren't looking at it all the time. 
didn't see. So maybe something had happened. And that's why I couldn't take the meat. had absolutely nothing to do with this. It's a classic case of, you know, comes into a suffix. We're going to hear more from Jen later about Sveikot. So that's our lead in. Okay. Last Mishnah of the parent. A little bit of a strange Mishnah, I have to say, because we were on the topic of Tchum, right? We've been dealt with Muktzah in the beginning of the Masechet, and we dealt with it in the middle of the Masechet. And, but then we got into Erev Tchumin. And all of a sudden, the Mishnah goes back and almost mentions things from the very beginning of the Masechet. Remember, we talked about birds, and you had to designate them. Otherwise, you wouldn't have intended to slaughter them. Now we're going to talk about animals. They're different than birds, because animals, if they're your animals, you intended probably, likely, that you might want to slaughter them. So we're going to distinguish between two types of animals. There's ones that live out in the desert, and there's ones that live or more domesticated. You can't water and slaughter. It sounds funny in English, right? Water and slaughter. You can't, I guess, hose them down, right? Get them wet and slaughter them on Yantif if they're desert ones. But you can do it if they're domestic ones. Elohim bayatot. So what is, we obviously want to define, what does it mean domestic? What does it mean midbariot? By a toter halanot ba'ir, the ones who sleep in the city, midbariot halanot ba'afal, the ones who sleep out in the pasture. So the Gemara says, what does this mashkim have anything to do with it? It's not a malacha, lashkot, to pour water on an animal. So he says, milta agav orche kamashman, teaches you something, by the way, delishke enish behem tov ahadar, lishkot mishum sracha dimashcha. It's actually better, easier to flay the hide of the animal to take it off when you water the animal first. So because of that, this becomes a yantif need, and therefore you can do it on yantif only if you can slaughter the animal. Can't slaughter the animal, you can't. But it's teaching you something about how it worked with animals. Tanu Rabbanam. But now we get to the main thing, which is, okay, now we have a debate about midbariyot and bayatot. In our mission, it gave us a very clear-cut definition. Now we're going to have a debate. Elohim midbariyot ve Elohim bayatot. Midbariyot kosh yotzot bepesach, v'root ba'afar, v'nechnesot b'reviyah rishona, which is right now, when the first rains come in Cheshvan. So the animals, these are animals that go out after Pesach or around Pesach time. They go out to graze. They come back in the rainy season. Those are midbariyot. What are bayatot? Kosh yotzot v'root chutz latchum. They go out and they go far, but ba'ov alanot betoch hatchum, but they always come back into the tchum of the city to sleep. So ones that sleep out for, let's say, six months of the year, those are midbariyot. The ones who sleep out, who sleep at home always, or sleep within the tchum anyway, those are bayatot. But there's a machloket about this, okay? Not everyone agrees. That's one. But Rebbe Omer, elu ve'elu bayatotin. Those are both domesticated because in the end, those come back in the rainy season. So they're still called domesticated. But what are midbariyot? which are considered muktza, right? He's going to basically say there's less ones that are considered muktza, right? But the, the whole idea here again is if I'm going to slaughter an animal, did I have in mind I was going to slaughter this animal? Not if it was not at, in my house at all or, or far off. So the question is how far off did it have to be? So according to Rebbe, only if it's yotzof v'roop afal ve'enif nesot v'yishuv lo b'yamarach hamal lo b'yamarach shamim. It never comes back it, always grazing out, right? You see those people, shepherds, I mean, I don't know how often you see them, but in Israel, sometimes you see these shepherds, right? They never bring their sheep back. That's called, those are the ones that you can't slaughter because they weren't ready at all. Well, the Gemara is going to have a very odd question. And why is this an odd question? Well, Rebbe is Rabbi Yudanasi, who put together the mission. And we've been learning this entire Masechet. We've dealt a lot with Muktza and all those issues. All of a sudden, they ask this question, wait a minute. Rebbe, you said, now it's true he had a narrower definition as to what was muktzah, but he does say those animals are muktzah. So they now say, wait a minute, me ain't little Rebbe muktzah? Does Rebbe really hold by muktzah? The ha ba mine Rebbe Shimon, remember the big famous machloka, Rebbe Shimon, Rebbe Yehuda, do we have muktzah? Do we not hold muktzah? So here we go. We're going to try to prove, right? Until now, notice we never asked what Rebbe holds about this, but now we're going to say, wait, this seems to imply Rebbe holds muktzah because he says, if they're ones that don't live in the city, you can't slaughter them. They're muktza, even though you didn't, right? The only way, we'll see this in a minute, but Shema holds muktza in grow, grow simukim, which were ripe. And then you put them on your roof and you said, I want to dry these out. I don't plan to ever use them. And you push them off. It's called the You basically said, I don't intend to use this. But if you didn't say that, anything short of that would not be muktza. Now, according to Rebbe, if you have these animals who don't live ever at home, you know, in the city, they're muktza. So it sounds like Rebbe holds muktzah, but, and it's a very strange question against Rebbe, because 
Rabbi Shimon bar Rebbe mi Rebbe. Rabbi Shimon his son asked Rebbe, Patsileit maral Rabbi Shimon man. These are dates that never ripen on the tree. You put them in a basket so that while they're in this basket, they'll ripen. Now that's not the same as Gorgod and Simukim because you didn't push them off. You just, they were never ripe to begin with. The issue with Gorgod and Simukim is that you, they were good. And then you push them off and said, well, I don't want them until they fully dry. This is a little bit different. So they asked, according to Rabbi Shimon, they asked Rabbi, is this Muktzer or not? So I'm really, ain't Muktzer the Rabbi Shimon, ele grow grow for Simukim bova. No, he doesn't know. Mukta only grow goat and simuki. To which they say, so there you see, Rebbe holds there's no muksa. Now it's a little bit of a strange question because he asked the question according to Rabbi Shimon. He didn't ask the question, Rebbe, what do you think? He said, what about Rabbi Shimon? So that's going to be one of the answers. It's a little bit of a strange question. But anyway, the Gemara answers, Ebai Gamer, we're going to introduce each by you could say this, you could say this, or you could say this. Three possible answers. Hane Nami, you could grow goat, but simuki Nami, you could say that those dried. You're, you're basically trying to ripen those dates. That's just like the figs and the, and the grapes that you're trying to dry out. It's no different. So then you could say, right, that would explain why he holds that, right? That he basically does hold like Rabbi Shimon. I'm sorry, that he holds, I'm sorry, I just said that wrong. My confusion. What he's saying is that the animals, the midbariot, are like Rogrofetzimu Kim, because you really said, I don't want them ever coming into the, the town. So they're really like you push them off. Okay, that's one. Ebayt Ema, Lidvarav de Rabbi Shimon Kamar Velelo Sfirale, which is the way we understood the question. What do you mean? He was asking about Rabbi Shimon's opinion. He wasn't asking about Rabbi's opinion. Rabbi was just giving Rabbi Shimon's opinion. Vibayt Ema, third possibility, Lidvarahem de Rabbanan Kamar Lehu. He was actually speaking according to the rabbi's opinion. What he said is like this Lididi ain't Mukta. I don't believe in Mukta at all. I'm like Rabbi Shimon, right? But Lidid Hu. But when he said about these animals, the Midbariot, he said, listen, at least oduli mia, at least admit to me. At least agree with me on this issue, that if they do come back at some point, those are called domesticated. And then, in other words, he wasn't talking according to his opinion. His opinion is really like Rabbi Shimon. There is no muktzah, but he was saying, according to you, the rabbis, right? He was trying to put words in their mouth. At least you'll admit with me this. No, and they don't, okay? With a very strange way, we end the Masechet on those words, okay? Um, with that, Hadron Alach Mashil and Perot Uslika Masechet Beitz. Very strange end to the Masechet. Strange because, first of all, all of a sudden, at the end, we're bringing up Muktzah again. Also, we're getting into Rebbe, like what? Rebbe, we don't know what he holds about Muktzah, like all this time, he, he's the one put together the Mishnah. And we're asking this question where he was saying, according to Rabbi Shimon, it's a very strange end to the Masechet. Um, you know, I think there's a little bit of this issue of, you know, don't try to put words into people's mouths, you know, a little bit of that. Um, anyway, I want to, it ends with a lot of lack of clarity. If you have to talk about one, one topic, which is something that Jen is also going to introduce in her talk about this lack of clarity. And I think when I look back at the Masechet and I think about what this Masechet is all about, right? You do a zoom out. It's always hard to do that when you're doing Dapyom. But really what went on in this Masechet all around, all over was balancing. It's, we balance Simcha Yom Tov. Remember all those sugyas? Oh, what do you mean? Beit Shammai looks like he's machmir about Simcha Yom Tov or he's nekel about it, right? Do we, we have this issue. We want to eat on Yantif. We want to eat fresh food. But we also don't want to do malacha that we, we're not allowed to do. We don't want to do things that look like a weekday because then people will come to not take Yantif seriously and get confused about what exactly is the nature of Yantif. We have muktzah issues, right? It's all this balancing. How do we balance our need to eat and have fresh food and also balance that with all the prohibitions. And, and I think in general, right, our, our lives are all about this balancing act of we have conflicting interests, things pulling us in different directions. And I think what the, what the Masechet is ending with, and, and I think it's really something good for a Dafyomi learner, which is, I know a lot of people feel very often in Dafyomi that, um, and, and myself included, that we just keep moving at a frenetic pace and you don't remember everything. And you come out of a city, sometimes you say, well, what's the halacha? And what was the bottom line? And, and I'm confused a little bit. But what are we getting when, when we learned off Yomi? We're getting all the concepts and the ideas behind everything. And there's not always clear cut answers. In the end, the Masechah ends with this big confusion. We don't know really what Rebbe held. And there's this idea about things pulling you in one direction, things pulling you in another. And what we end up from our learning of Dafyomi is, seeing everything and understanding the concepts 
And those concepts is what takes you, right? Because in the end, there aren't always clear cut answers, but when you understand the concept behind something, it means a lot more to you. And it, it also helps you when it, you come into a situation, you remember, right? Like if you think about sukkah, right? When we, then you sat in your sukkah, you remembered all these concepts that we learned. You might not have remembered everything about it and what's allowed and what's not, but you remembered all the concepts. And that's, I think, what the beauty of learning Dafyomi is getting all the concepts behind everything. Even if you don't remember exactly how to do things, fine. You can always go, you know, look at a book or consult a rabbi or, or uh, you know, anyone who's knowledgeable. Yeah, there's so many options, but the idea of learning every day is to get this idea and, and seeing it all of the, the concepts behind everything. So with that, we'll finish our Masechet. We'll say the, the last Hadron again, one last time. Hadron alach mashil in perot, uslika Masechet beitza. And now I'll pull up the, the um, hadrons, we will say them together. Okay, here it goes. Ha, we're, again, we're going to say the first part three times. Hadron alach mesechet beitza, the hadra halan. Dat an alach mesechet beitza, the data halan. Lo nitneshe minach mesechet beitza, the lo titneshe minan, lo baalma haden, the lo baalma daaten. Hadron alach mesechet beitza, the hadra halan. Dat an alach mesechet beitza, the data halan. Hanina bar papa, Rami bar papa, Nachman bar papa, Achai bar papa, Abar bar papa, Rathman bar papa, Rachish bar papa, Surcha bar papa, Ada bar papa, Daru bar papa. Harev na Adonai Elohenu et divre toratra befinu ufipiot amcha beit Israel. Nye anachnu kulanu tsetse enu vetsetse e amcha beit Israel. Kulanu yod e shemecha vlonde toratra lishma. דברי תמוד תורתך באהבה. וזכות כל התנאים והמוראים ותלמידי חכמים יעמוד לנו ולזרענו שלא תמוש התורה מפינו ומפי זרענו עד עולם. יתקיים בנו בתלכך תנחה אותך, בשוכבך תשמור עליך, בקיסותה היא תזיכך. היברי ירבו ימיך ויוסיפו לך שנות חיים, אורך ימים בימינה, שמאלה אושר וכבוד, אדוני עוז לעמו ייתן. Tonight, Barech et Amo Vashalom. Shakach, everybody, for finishing. Those who came to join us and are not finishing, Shakach to everybody here.